Hi, and welcome to the show. Rate and review at kevinemney.com slash rate. Subscribe at kevinemney.com slash podcast. Today on the show, we have Lisa Park. She's a pediatrician, and we're going to talk about her Kevin MD article, Bulletproof Backpacks. There's more we can do. Lisa, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks, Kevin. Thank you so much for the opportunity. We'll get into the article in a little bit. First off, briefly share your story and journey to where you are today. Okay, so I'm a pediatrician and with a subspecialty in adolescent medicine. I'm, I really love the adolescent and young adult age group because they're in this growth mindset where they're trying to figure out who they are and what they believe in. And it's fun and exciting to walk alongside them and give them good medical information so they know how to take care of themselves and advocate for themselves. I have a master's in public health, so I tend to look at problems systemic and the kind of bigger picture and other factors that affect our patients' health. And most recently, I worked in college health for the last 10 years at a large public university on the East Coast, and I was the director for the last four. Um, and during that last 10 years, we all saw, you know, all of your clinicians know, and any actually anybody in the U.S. knows that mental health has just been an increasing concern among our youth. We saw increased acuity and complexity. So one thing we did at our clinic that I'm really proud of is we established behavioral health clinic in our clinic, embedded in our clinic. So any kid that, any young adult that walked into the door would be screened for depression and substance abuse. And then if they screen um, abnormally, would be hooked up with a mental health clinician right then and there at that visit. So really reduce the barriers to accessing mental health care. So, so that was my most recent job. And after the last few years, grueling years as a healthcare leader during the pandemic, I've now turned to writing and continuing to advocate for our adolescents in that way. So tell me over the last few years while you were working at this college clinic, and I'm sure you've been seeing an increasing frequency of behavioral health issues. What about the toll that it took on clinicians like yourself and other staff members who were working there? That's a great question. I mean, as you all know, you know, if you've dealt with, actually all of us have dealt with mental health patients, it is something that really, it, it takes time and um, you get invested really in their care and it's a chronic condition usually, right? It's gone are the days in college health where we had simple problems like just homesickness, right? It's homesickness plus anxiety, depression, substance abuse. So what we realized in primary care and college health was our patients, you know, saw us as a resource. So that was great. You know, they came to us for colds and things like that, but often they wouldn't bring up these problems. Like they presented for fatigue, but really underlying that was depression, right? And unless we asked, they didn't necessarily bring it up because of a whole host of reasons, stigma, things like that. And so we really wanted to, as a primary care team, buttress you know, so up our knowledge of how to take care of these mental health concerns um, because it's so hard to access mental health as well. So it did take a toll, but I think having the tools in your toolkit on how to deal with those issues really empowers us and helps our patients. So now you're taking a break from clinical medicine, doing some writing and advocating. Do you mm -hmm. see yourself going back? Oh, you know, during the pandemic, people always ask me questions that I said, I wish I had a crystal ball. I love seeing patients. I think that somehow a mixture of both would be, you know, great for me and for my patients and my family. All right. So let's talk about the article about one of the issues that I'm sure you're advocating about. It's titled Bulletproof Backpacks. There's more we can do. Now, for those who didn't get a chance to read your article, just walk my audience through it. Share the story why you decided to write it. Sure. When the school shooting at Uvalde, Texas occurred, that was in May 24th, and it killed 19 students and two teachers and injured 17 more, I reacted really as a mom, right? And just that shock every time and sadness and just can't imagine what the parents were going through. Um, and the school year hadn't let out yet. So every day on the school bus, I would drop my kids off at the school bus stop and just pray and hope that I would see them coming, you know, off the bus again in the afternoon and just felt helpless and powerless. And over the course of the summer, I kind of thought, you know, I can do more than this, you know, as physicians or any healthcare providers, we like to solve problems, right? There has to be something we can do. So I drew upon my clinical experience with mental health patients, suicidal patients, looked at the evidence, draw upon my experience as a mom, right? Talking to other parents who felt similar, you know, distress. You had that med student that was great on your podcast who talked about, you know, in the ER, she was on her rotation. There was an infant with respiratory distress. Mm -hmm. All the mom wanted to talk about was this recent school shooting. And that's me. And that's us, right? When we hear these awful stories in the news. So the article really 
progressed and evolved from one of just raw and emotion and powerlessness to, hey, we aren't powerless. We can do things at every level to reverse this trend. So talk about some of the things that you do, not only in the exam room, but like you said, as you step up and take a more macro view of it, but let's start in the exam room. What are some things that you as a pediatrician can do? Yeah. And not as a pediatrician, but at really any of us in the healthcare field, we can do this. So I think one thing is just kind of realizing that firearms are here to stay. They're common and they're lethal, right? So there's just to share some stats, 254 million firearms in the U.S., and an estimated 54% of households that have firearms don't lock their guns. So meaning their firearms are not stored, un unloaded and ammunition separate from the firearm. And an estimated 4.6 million children live in households with unsecured firearms. So it's common. Chances are, if you're seeing any kind of patient, pediatric, any kind of patient, some of your patients have firearms. So we should get used to talking about it. And then well, the take us into is, one of those oh, conversations. Sure. So let's say, take yeah. us into the exam room. So let's say you were mm -hmm. talking to a family whose firearms are not locked or not secured. Mm -hmm. Tell me how that conversation goes. What kind of questions do you ask them? Yeah. So the first thing is framing it as just something normal that I talk about. Hey, you know, we talk about not texting when driving and you know, seatbelts. So another thing that I'm, that I want to make sure you're safe about with your kids is firearms. So do you have firearms in the home? And then if so, how do you store them? Right. We all think that we're really great at hiding things from our kids, but we are not right. They know where the best candy is. They know how to find all the dangerous things. So really like this is an anticipatory guidance type of conversation. Let's talk about it before it becomes a, a problem and become, before it becomes deadly. So we live in a polarized society. Obviously, everything is mm -hmm. politicized, especially guns. Do you mm -hmm. ever get pushback when you bring up this conversation in the exam room? Actually, I, I haven't if I approach it in that way. Like, hey, I talk to all my patients about this. It's kind of like any other sensitive topic, right? I talk about sexual health a lot in adolescent medicine, but just having the questions just, you know, practicing that language helps me just say it in a normal review systems way, right? Like, okay, well, let's just go through this and talk about it. And how can we be safer about it? And you're right, you know, it has become polarized, but I think that now it's become a safety issue, right? And I don't think anyone would disagree that they want to keep their kids and their loved ones and friends safe, right? So we can all agree at that baseline. And then how do we do that? All right. So let's move outside the exam room. What are some other things that we can do? Oh, well, one more thing. And I wanted to say this, that they're lethal, of course, right? And that's inside and outside the exam room. And uh, the sad statistic is that 90% of suicide attempts that involve a gun result in death versus 4% of suicide attempts that don't involve guns, say drug overdose, are lethal. So it's a 90% lethality rate. So if we had any other condition that we that had a 90% fatality rate, we would be talking about it, doing something about it, right? You don't avoid that subject. And talking about it with patients makes a lot of sense. And then you said outside of the exam room. Sure. So yeah, the AAP is about to re release a policy statement November 1st, just re updating their policy on firearm violence and reducing it in kids, because now it's the leading cause of childhood death from zero to 24, actually. So they take a harm reduction approach, which is similar to what I'm advocating for, right? Just talking about it, reducing the risk. But they said really is a multi-pronged approach where you are, you know, as a clinician, you can deal with it. We talked about how we talk about that with patients as a parent talking about it with other parents before play dates, before a kid sleeps over at another kid's house, just asking about firearms, just like we talk about allergies, right? Or pets in the home. And then, and then invo getting involved as a community. So advocating and voting, you know, those are, you know, really powerful things that we can do as clinicians, but even, you know, just as citizens of the U.S. I talked about in my article how the Bipartisan um, Safer Communities Act passed this summer, and that was the first major gun safety legislation in 26 years. So it is a long game, but it does matter, right, who we elect to office and what kind of policies they pass. So really just getting informed about what candidates will protect your community through gun safety legislation is really powerful and important. So one of the things that I always talk about on my site and on this podcast is that physicians, we need to advocate more, not just for guns, but for a variety of issues. Mm -hmm. Give us an example of how your advocacy in the past could be writing or speaking or connecting with politicians. Give me an example of how that has moved the needle for you. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. I think that um, 
as physicians, we have this social capital, right? That mm-hmm. people see us as experts because we train, you know, in this field and we advocate for the safety of our patients every single day in whatever way that looks like. So I think that what I did was in, you know, I I talked about the evolution of this article. I got involved with Moms Demand Action, which is a nationwide um, organization that advocates for gun safety. And they do the whole range, right? They do canvassing, especially before election day, talking to legislatures, state and federal, and then op-eds, you know, what I had the opportunity to publish it in your blog. And doing things like going to the community organizations like churches and PTAs and talking to parents about, hey, this is how you store guns safely if you do have them. So really there's a place for all of us. You don't have to be this you know, marching in the streets, but you can, if you're really good at that, you know, and then you're extroverted and that, you know, floats your boat, but then there's also room for the quieter advocacy, you know, one-on-one with a patient, one-on-one with a parent, and just, you know, talking about it in that way too. I think we can all do our part. There's a substantial proportion of the population who sees the issue not so much as gun safety or gun control, but more of a behavioral health issue. So mm-hmm. how do you respond to someone who has that perspective? So I did talk about that in my article that it's really and, right? You need to have both of those conversations and both of those are large complex problems that we need to attack. And mental health issues, of course, you know, suicide is one of the major causes of death from firearms as well as homicide. So we need to be addressing suicide prevention and asking about depression and suicide. And we also need to be talking about firearms because it may not come up if you don't, if you wait to talk about mental health and wait until there's a crisis in mental health before you talk about firearms. You may have missed your opportunity for the firearm to be locked up and safely secured. And then suicide attempts tend to be, you know, depression is long, you know, can be long standing. but then the suicide thought of attempting suicide often is very impulsive. And often individuals that want to carry out a suicide it will happen within an hour of when they have that thought. So it's a very, you know, important intervention that you could have done, you know, a few months ago to talk about securely storing a firearm that can save someone's life in that moment. So you really, we need to have, be having both conversations and advocating for both important issues. We're talking to Lisa Park. She's a pediatrician and her Kevin MD article is titled Bulletproof Backpacks. There's more we can do. Lisa, so what are some pieces of advice that you could give to my clinician audience? It could be either inside the exam room or even outside doing some advocacy work. What kind of actionable advice can you give to advance this issue? Well, I think that the first thing to do is get comfortable talking about it. Like I said, you know, it's, it can become part of your guidance about safety if you're a pediatrician, but really anybody can have that Mm -hmm. conversation. Because if you're an adult internal medicine doctor, You might have a parent, you know, sitting across the room from you with a kid and they may have firearms. So it's worth talking about and, uh, you know, screening for mental health as well. The other thing that a lot of people don't realize is there's this continuum, you know, it's of course not having the firearm in the home is probably the safest way to reduce, uh, you know, lethal suicide attempts. But you, if there is a firearm in the home, you go from the basic, which is safe storage, the gun and the ammunition separately locked, unloaded. And then if there's the next step of that is if you know that a loved one has had depression or has had suicide attempts, taking the keys when they're in the moment of crisis, think about, you know, kind of how we envision drunk driving. Everybody knows, take the keys and it doesn't solve the alcoholism, but you're removing in that moment, right, of potential crisis, injury, death, you're removing the lethal means. So giving the keys or the, changing the combination to the locked safe, right, that the gun is kept in. That's the next step. Out of home storage, many states have ways that you can temporarily give your gun to a gun store, to mm-hmm. law enforcement, things like that. So it's out of uh, creating that time and space between the individual and the firearm. And then it goes all the way to extreme risk protection order, which are red flag laws where you, uh, uh, law enforcement or family can petition the court to temporarily remove access to firearms. So we have all these things in our toolkit and it's worth researching so that you can talk to your patients that have had mental health issues or even ones that have firearms and no mental health issues, right? So they know what the options are to for everyone to stay safe. And my final question, what are some of your take-home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin and the audience? 
My take home message would be, we are not powerless. Unfortunately, every week there is another shooting, which is just awful and shocking, but we can move from that and do something about it at any level. Clinicians talk to your patients, parents talk to other parents, vote and look up those candidates and they, they vote for gun safety legislation and get involved. There are so many things we can do and every step is necessary. So, so don't feel powerless. We can do something about this. Lisa, thank you so much for sharing your time and insight. Thanks again for being on the show. Thank you. 